Crowley. We come now to the fifth study period here at the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the four o'clock session on Sabbath afternoon, the first Sabbath of our week together. We now return to a continued study of the Laodicean message to identify what it actually is. And of course I recognise that um, in some respects we're covering old ground for some of you at least, but there are some folk here who haven't heard these things before, so I'll cover them in detail for them. Now, it's very important that we understand what the white raiment actually is. Many people think it's a robe that is placed over the sinful condition of the person, so we have the righteous appearance masking a sinful heart still. Let's come back to Zechariah, the third chapter in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 3, where we have the wonderful parable of Joshua and the angel, Zechariah, the third chapter. Start with verse 1 and read down to about verse 7, or verse 8 perhaps. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord which, who hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the, before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and, and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested to Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among those who stand by. Hear now, Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for their men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the engraving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbour under the vine and under the fig tree. The picture here is Joshua as a symbol of God's people standing before the angel who is Jesus Christ and he is dressed in dirty clothes or filthy garments. Now those filthy garments clearly and plainly represent his iniquity or his sinfulness and that's proved by reading verse 4 which says, And he, the angel of the Lord, answered and spake, spake unto those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, in other words, to those who stood by the command was given, and now Jesus gives an explanation of what the command means. He says, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. Now, of course, that's verified uh, in the Testimonies, Volume 5, such a way plainly says that the filthy garments represent our defective characters or our actual sinfulness which is stripped away at the command of the Holy One who stands by. <clears throat> and that, that is also clearly shown, shown when it says, I have caused your iniquity or sinfulness to pass from you. Now this is not a reference to guilt, but rather to a sinful condition or state of being, which is the problem at this point of time. I turn now to the, to the um, book, Testimonies, Volume 5, and uh, I'll read the statement which tells us that um, this represents a defective char character. It's right, page four, 473, Testimonies, Volume 5. Their only hope is in the mercy of God, their only defense will be prayer. As Joshua was pleading before the angels, so the remnant church, with brokenness of heart and earnest faith, will plead for pardon and deliverance through Jesus their advocate. They are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their lives, they see their weakness and unworthiness, and as they look upon themselves, they read the despair. The, st the tempter stands by to accuse them as he stood by to resist Joshua. 
he points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. There's the actual sentence. He points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. So dirty garments symbolize a defective character. It symbolizes sinfulness. It symbolizes iniquity. It symbolizes, it symbolizes an unholy condition within the person. And when the command is given, take away the filthy garments from him, what is the only possible interpretation of those words? Does it indicate uh, a plan to place a clean garment over dirty clothes? Not at all. That interpretation would never be justified. It plainly says, take away the filthy garments from him and clothe him with a change of raiment. Say to any mother whose child has come in from playing outside and has now got dirty clothes on, they've been probably paddling in puddles and making mud pies and whatever, and when the child comes in and someone says to the mother, take away the dirty garments from the child and give them a change of raiment, what is the only interpretation you give to those words? And the answer is obvious. She strip the child, bath him and give him, a, give him a new set of clothes in the place of the dirty clothes which were there before. And that is um, what God proposes to do so far as our sinfulness is concerned. Let me turn now to Christ's object lessons to read some more plain statements in this regard. In the wonderful chapter called The Wedding Garment, I turn to page 310 in the book Christ Object Lessons to read these words. By the wedding garment in the parable is represented the pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. Now, if you possess a pure, spotless character, then that means that within yourself you are a pure and spotless person. You can't possess a pure and spotless character without being pure and spotless, right? You just can't do that. And here we have a plain definition. Sister White says, By the wedding garment and the parable is represented the pure spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. It's not an imputed robe, it's an imparted robe. To the church it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteousness of saints. It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character, that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal saviour. Now to leave no doubt as to what she's talking about, Sister White now refers to the experience of Adam and Eve back in the garden in these words. The white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in Holy Eden. They lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. All the strength of their affection was given to their heavenly father. A beautiful soft light, the light of heaven, enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. Had they remained true to God, it would, ne it would ever have continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God and the light that had encircled them departed. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. Let's now catch the significance of this particular paragraph. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had righteousness within. There's no question about that. I refer, of course, to that period of time before they sinned. They had righteousness within, and while they had righteousness within, what did they have outside? A beautiful robe of soft light. Now, when the righteousness within disappeared, what happened to the robe of light? It also disappeared. In other words, the Garden of Eden teaches the important lesson that you cannot have the covering without unless you have the presence within. Right? Now, you, it may be asked then, of course, why then don't we today again receive the covering or the beautiful soft garment of light outside when we receive the beautiful garment of righteousness inside? In other words, why don't we find the spiritual robe of righteousness again being matched by the outward robe of light that Adam and Eve enjoyed back in the Garden of Eden. We have to remember, of course, that in order to have that garment of light, they also had to have sinless, immortal flesh and blood. And we know perfectly well that in this world of sin, we don't get the uh, 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 immortal, uh, sinless flesh and blood until Jesus Christ comes again the second time. 
Of course, um, if if every true Christian, every, everyone with the righteousness of Christ was to receive this, this soft robe of light, we'd inst instantly know which was the true church, wouldn't we? <laughs> we no doubt, no question left. And it's rather fortunate that we don't get that robe of light back today as the, out the outward uh, evidence or sign because uh, it would then remove from us the need to, or the opportunity to pass the test of... Um, of um, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil in other words before sin entered the angels and our first parents only had to pass the test of, 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 of receiving truth they didn't have to discern whatever it was but since the fall of course since man gained the knowledge of good and evil we have to pass the test of uh, rejecting the evil and choosing the good in its place now coming a little further down on page 311 I'll read these words this robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising no human works no human devising is uh, of any use in trying to form this robe Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character and this character he offers to impart to us all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags Isaiah 64 verse 6 everything, everything that we can I'll be fine everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin but the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin sin is defined to be transgressed of the law but Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law he said of himself I, I delight to do thy will O my God yea thy law is within my heart when on earth he said to his disciples I have kept my father's commandments John 15 verse 10 now the next few lines really define in the clearest possible terms what it means to be clothed in the garment of his righteousness I read on by his perfect obedience he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments when we submit ourselves to God Christ the heart is united with his heart the will is merged in his will the mind becomes one with his mind the thoughts are brought into captivity to him we live his life this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness then as the Lord looks upon us he sees not the fig leaf garment not the nakedness deformity of sin but his own robe of righteousness which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah now there we have a list of um, what shall I call them qualifications or evidences evidence is a better word a list of evidences to tell us if we are clothed with the garment of his righteousness and here they are it says the heart is united with his heart that's one point next one the will is merged in his will and that indicates of course that we are obeying his command and the Sabbath rest principles he is the head we're the member the mind becomes one with his mind the thoughts are brought into captivity to him we live his life then if those things are so we are clothed with the garment of his righteousness and God looks down upon us and sees not the fig leaf garment but perfect to be to, to, to the law of Jehovah of course I know that um, when people have spent shall we say 10, 20, 30, 40 years struggling to obey the law of God well they're still uh, hampered or handicapped by the presence of the old sinful nature and therefore achieved nothing better than a, than a tough struggle described in, as, as described in Romans chapter 7 that people are very slow to believe that, that we can live a life of sinlessness a life of victory over every known sin in our experience but the word of God makes it clear that that is what God has in store for his people now once again of course we spend many hours and days studying the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ we've done that in previous camp meetings I want to just mainly summarize the headlines today and so we move on to the eye cell which of course is spiritual discernment and uh, faith again faith that works by love and purifies the soul is the key of knowledge and once a person receives the transforming grace of Christ the books of the Bible and spirit prophecy become new books altogether and I was most uh, heartened to hear some folk discussing this point last night and testifying to the change in spiritual perception which they enjoyed once they had entered into a new birth experience once they had passed from bondage to freedom and the message had worked in their heart and life now, I remember myself that um, I read Desire of Ages through seven times before the 1888 message came 
and I thought it was a very wonderful book. When the message came, I reopened the book and was amazed how much more I saw in those pages. They now became very, very much alive to me. And I saw depths and heights and, and breadths of truth I'd never, ever perceived before. And, of course, um, Paul prayed in Ephesians that this would be the experience of God's people. This, this turns a little uh, epistle to the Ephesians to read that very beautiful prayer that Paul prayed so far as God's people are concerned. Ephesians, the uh, third chapter, and starting with verse 15, or verse 14 rather. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think, we ask or think, according to the rich, the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now Paul's great prayer was that the believers might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth of, and height, but that they might be able to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Have you ever felt in yourself a, a deep yearning, a great desire to... Uh, spend time alone with God as Moses did on, on the mountain and there receive tremendous revelations of God's life and love and power. I certainly have and I've prayed most earnestly for an experience like that of Moses. I think of the time when he said to God, show me your glory and God uh, placed him in the cleft of the rock and declared to him his character which was full of mercy and love and kindness and forgiveness and long-suffering. And the greatest joy that any human being can know is to receive a revelation of God. And um, when we receive the heavenly eye cell, as we have learned, most of us in this room, that this was the beginning of a new day of comprehension, a new day of capacity, a new day of ability to see what we had never been able to see before, to, um, to be aware of the riches and power and grace of God in a measure which we had never previously known and the books of the Bible became, became new books altogether. Now, that is a very brief summary of the offering made by God to the Laodicean Church. We could, of course, spend much, much more time on, on those elements which we have, but we have done that before, so I shan't repeat myself again today. Now, let's come now to a very vital conclusion. It might be one that some might be reluctant to accept, but the simple fact is this, that when the land of sin is described as being wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked and to remedy this, this destitution they're counseled to buy gold, white bread and an eye cell the inference is, and it's a very strong undeniable inference too that the church doesn't have the gold, the white bread and the eye cell because if they had them, why should God say come and buy them? You don't buy what, you, what you've got already you don't buy what you don't need you don't buy that which you're already possessed of. In other words, if you have a shining brand new motor car, you rush out and buy a second one when there's no need to. Obviously not. So then, this means the lay of the sin church, unless face the truth of the matter, it's written there by the true witness, and we can't deny what he has to say, that when the church does not have the gold, it doesn't have justification by faith. When it doesn't have the white ram, it doesn't have righteousness by faith. And when it doesn't have the eye cell, it just simply doesn't have spiritual discernment. Now, if a church does not have justification by faith and the righteousness of Jesus Christ and spiritual discernment, then it doesn't have the gospel, right? It doesn't have the gospel. Because if you have the gospel, which is the power of God to save from sin, Romans 1.16, then the, the gospel puts into you that faith whereby you lay hold upon justification which is the gold tried in the fire and pure, the pure, and that purifies the soul you receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ and of course you have you have the eye cell now this means then 
and uh, it means in very plain terms that, that when Sutra was, was led to write in volume on the testimonies page 186 that um, she, she wrote I was shown that the message to later sins applies to God's people at the present time let me get the exact words again from volume 1 make sure I have every word uh, quoted there correctly page 186 in the book volume 1 of the testimonies right she said um, I was shown who by the true witness that the testimony to the land of sins applies to God's people at the present time and the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts so coming down to 1859 when that testimony was written we find that the true witness declares that the church did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ at that point of time the power of God to save from sin was no longer pressed in the organisation and that's a very terrible situation to arrive at as, as we we'll all, 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 all recognise now let's now come back a moment to the point that the Laodicean message therefore is the offering of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the sinners who are complacently pursuing their their uh, works program trying to serve God by their own hard sacrifice and so forth just as the Jews of course did in olden times I come back now to page 9-2 in the book Testaments to Ministers perhaps I'll read from page 91-292 again I began this paragraph before I want to now complete it the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elders Wagner and Jones this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted saviour, the sacrifice of the sins of the whole world it presented justification through faith and assurity it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God many had lost sight of Jesus they needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person his mercy, his changeless love for the human family all power is given unto his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world it is the third angel's message which is, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure so first of all we find that Wagon and Jones bought the gold the white flame and the eye salve what else could they bring because to what church were they preaching the Laodicean church right in the Laodicean condition and what is the only message which will cure that problem the Laodicean message so without question Wagner and Jones brought the Laodicean message to the Laodicean people back in 1888 at the same time Sister White described it as being the third angel message in verity which of course is the gospel of Jesus Christ so whenever the gospel of Christ is preached to a person who is steeped in his own works what are you preaching to that person? the Laodicean message, right? the Laodicean message it might, have, might not always be called that but every single presentation of the gospel to a person who is still burdened by sin is a presentation of the Laodicean message to Laodiceans now to make that point quite clear um, we'll go back in history just a little bit further let's now consider for instance the Sardis church for a moment and generally speaking we recognize the Sardis church to be that church which was um, in existence leading up to the time when William Miller began to proclaim his message and of course uh, when he began to proclaim his message as well let's go back to Revelation 3 and we'll read the first few verses of that chapter which outlined for us the condition of the Sardis church when the message came to the lips of William Miller and those who worked together with him Revelation 3 starting with verse 1 and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things saith he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know your works that you have a name that you live in but you're dead be watchful and, and strengthen the thing which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect before God remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou, if ever thou shalt not watch or come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee 
Thou hast a few names even in Cyrus which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now that's the message of the Sardis church. Now the Sardis church was a, an, an apostate Reformation church. For instance in verse 3, uh, well first of all verse 1, the Lord says, I know your works, you have a name that you live but you're dead. Now the Protestant churches, which of course are the Reformation churches, emerged from their conflict with Rome, with the papacy, a very illustrious conflict and a very marvellous victory too, to say the least of it. And they emerged in that period with, um, with distinction. They had earned for themselves a great name, a great reputation. They had gone to war with Rome, the seemingly in, unconquerable power which ruled the entire world at that time, and they had emerged from that conflict victorious. The Pope was in exile and had died in exile, and um, it looked as if the papal power had been broken forever. But the name which they had depended upon the presence in them of the power of God. Now, we might think, of course, that the great reformers uh, mainly occupied themselves with denouncing the mendicant friars and the abuses of Rome, and were not inclined to think of them as being great gospel preachers. But if you read the book by A.T. Jones entitled Lessons from the Reformation, you realise that they were mighty gospel preachers. And only because they were mighty gospel preachers was I able to overthrow the power of Rome outwardly because first of all the gospel had overthrown the power of Rome inwardly. In fact, um, as I read the Lessons of the Reformation, as I read quotations by A.T. Jones from men like Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Savonola and other great leaders of that time, I was really impressed with the clarity and the power which they did understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And A.T. Jones makes the point in the chapter entitled Reformation, um, what's the one again? Building of the Church, I think it was. No, that, that can't be quite. Anyway, in one chapter, I don't have the book here, unfortunately, but he made the point that uh, the Reformation, oh, thank you very much. I can now read the exact words. Thank you. There's the book, Lessons of the Reformation by A.T. Jones. And uh, A.T. Jones, in this particular statement which I'm about to read, made the point that um, it was not uh, protests or such which uh, brought about the Reformation, but rather it was the preaching of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I might have a moment to find this. Uh, yes, it starts on page uh, 66 of this particular edition of the book Lessons of the Reformation. The question rises, how came the Reformation? I like the way Jones puts his question so tersely into the point. And the answer comes, and, and it's a different answer from what we would tend to think, the Reformation did not and does not consist in exposure and denunciation of the indignities of the Roman Church. Now all too many reformers, or so-called reformers, think that they're going to affect the Reformation by denouncing the sins in the church and warning folk that these, the, that these sins are sins. I think if they call, if they, uh, call sin by its right name, if they inform the people that that particular thing is sin, that that's all that's necessary to affect the Reformation. But it doesn't, by any manner of means. And it didn't in the Roman church either. And so Jones points out, and he was a very, very thorough student of history, the Reformation did not and does not consist in exposure and denunciation of the iniquities of the Roman Church. That is included in the Reformation as an incident because it is of the essence of Christianity to hate iniquity as it is to love righteousness. It was the iniquities, enormities and desolations wrought by the Roman Church that caused the universal desire and the pressing demand that there should be a Reformation Yet the Reformation was not brought by magnifying or dwelling upon these things. I, I just really love that uh, assessment on Jones' part. The Reformation springs from another principle, lives in another atmosphere and works in another field than that. If exposure, now to prove his point, and the point is well proved by this next statement, if exposure and denunciation of the iniquities of that church could have wrought Reformation, 
than the Reformation would have been in the world more than 500 years before it was. Now you don't dispel darkness by telling darkness is dark. It doesn't work. You dispel darkness by bringing the light in, don't you? That's all, it, it always works that way. So, if exposure and denunciation of the iniquities of that church could have wrought Reformation, then the Reformation would have been in the world more than 500 years before it was. The quotations in the preceding chapter of the many scathing words of denunciation and exposure of the Roman Church on her own part and of the papacy as a whole and all by men of standing in that church itself are sufficient to show that if that could work reformation there was enough of it to have accomplished the most complete and perfect reformation. Yet all that is only a little of what could just as easily be quoted and all of it said by men who lived their days and died in full knowledge of membership in that church some of them now saints in that church the men whose preaching made the reformation could have said all that they ever said and more in denunciation of the iniquities in the church and in normalities of the popes and yet could have remained in good standing in that church all their days if they had still held that, that church to be the only and true church and have held themselves in conformity with her accordingly and it goes on and uh, talks about the fact that there was ample denunciation in the church. It was, it was made by uh, nobles, kings, emperors, priests, bishops, cardinals and councils and even popes confessed the sore need of reformation. In other words, people knew things were wrong, they knew the sins were there. What they didn't know was how to get out of the sin problem. And uh, what people need today not, is not so much to be told that their sins are sins. They know it already. They know that. They and they want to get rid of these sins and to come along and, and dwell upon the sins that can be only discourage them all the more and prevents them from reaching out by faith for victory. Now reading further, but from whatever cause a reformation was desired, it was always attempted without righteousness. It was from men only and not from God. And it was in this way from the very men who were essentially the cause of the demand for reform and were essentially of the thing that must be reformed, that is the church. Now when today we hear men in the church, be it the Adventist church or otherwise, stand up and express dismay and concern because of the iniquity in the church and express the desire for a reformation, don't forget that in the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages there were popes, nobles, kings, emperors, priests, bishops, cardinals and councils who expressed the same sentiments and called for the same reformation but never achieved it, never ever achieved it. It was not until, as we shall read in a moment, men arose proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ that the Reformation began. But first let me read a little more of what uh, is written here. It says, Inevitably, all such attempts must be flat failures. How dismal was the effort, the failure, of the Council of Constance at Reformation when what was considered the best that it could do to save the church, the burning of Huss and Jerome, was the worst thing that could possibly have done for any cause or for any reason. Now the Council of Constance met, for, it was called by the Emperor Sigismund, and it was met for the express purpose of talking about reforming the church of that time. And uh, the, the church of course uh, proposed this and that and the other plan, and one of the things that they proposed was the burning of Huss and Jerome, the men whom God has sent with a message which would bring about reformation and therefore this guaranteed that the very church which was seeking reformation uh, guaranteed there would be no reformation. The explanation of this blank incongruity and the key of the whole vicious circle of self-involved contradictions is in the fact that all those men who denounced the popes and their evil practices and the extortions and oppressions of the clergy held that the church of which all these evils were but the expression was a true and only church. Even when they were compelled to admit that the church was inextricably involved in it all, and when they were thus required to reflect upon, even upon the church, this was always done with the reservation and apology that in spite of all this she was the, only, the true and only church. They denounced the men and the activities of the men, even of the popes and the papal court, but still apologized and pleaded for the machine. They condemned the evil practices, but justified the system of which alone it was possible that those practices could not, not only be perpetuated, but could even exist. 
the times were evil but the church which made the times what they were was righteous church men were bad but the church whose members and the expression of whose life those churchmen essentially were was good customs were pernicious but the church whose the customs essentially were was the abode of sanctity practices were abominable but the church which invented many and profited by all of them was holy and so it goes on and and expose of course the the inconsistent thinking that possessed the minds of folk back in those days that's page 67 I now pass across to page 68 and um, right I now be on page 68 I, I missed a few paragraphs to save time it says um, so long as this delusion was systematically inculcated blindly received and fondly hugged of course reformation was impossible but as soon as there arose men with the courage of conviction and the confidence of truth and spoke out plainly and flatly that the Roman system was not the church at all in any feature in any sense then the reformation had begun this is how the reformation began, came without that the reformation could never have come the reformation as in the 16th century the times of Luther is not in fact the beginning of the reformation there was there was more the revival of it than the beginning and somewhere here it says um, we just lost the place at the moment but it definitely says that when those men came preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that is what brought about the beginning of the reformation right now when if we go back to Roman times of course to, to papal times and ask ourselves what was the condition of the church we'd say well, it was self-righteous and there was definitely an apostasy and to that church Millets and Luther and Wycliffe and Huss and Jerome preached the gospel of Jesus Christ therefore they preached the lay of the sin message to a church and lay of the sin condition and when they did that they developed or, or gained themselves a tremendous name but by the time of, 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 of William Miller it could be written to them that they had a name that they lived but they're dead the name the life was gone and the reputation but the reputation remained and the Lord said to them I know your works that you have a name that you live but you are dead now what difference then was, was there between the Sardis church and the Laodicean church what difference is there there's no difference and in the Bible commentary volume 7 in Sister Wise comments upon the Sardis church we find that she does in fact link the Sardis and the, and the Laodicean churches as being in the same sad condition the same sad and desperate need let me read the statement for you here from volume 7 and the page is um, a moment Right, the page, I think it's page um, 958. Right, page 959. And this is a comment, first of all, in the Sardis Church, which passes across into the Laodicean Church. In the message to the church at Sardis, two parties are presented, those who have a name to live but are dead, and those who are striving to overcome. And of course they are the ones when it says I have a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. That's the other party. Study this message found in the third chapter of Revelation, Revelation 3 verse 1 and 2. Who are meant by those who are ready to die? And what has made them thus the explanation is given? I have not found your works perfect before God. To the church of the present day this message is sent. And what was the present day? The quote comes from the View and Herald, August 28, uh, 1903. So in 1903, Sister Wise says that the message to the Sardis Church applied to the Church of 1903. I'll read the words again. To so the Church of the present day, this message is sent. I call upon our Church members to read the whole of the third chapter of Revelation to make an application of it. The message of the Church of the Laodiceans applies especially to the people of God today. It's a message to professing Christians who have become so much like the world that no difference can be seen. Now let's note the facts here. Sister Wise said in 1903 that the message of the Sardis Church was sent to the Church of that day. She, she said the Laodicean message also applies to the Church of that day. So Sister White saw quite correctly a very close relationship between the lay of the sin and Sardis conditions. Let's just summarize them. Now, 
The Sardis Church had a name that they lived with. What were they? Dead. Did the Adventist Church have a living name? A grand reputation? Certainly. The exploits of the 1844 period, or the 33 to 44 period, were very wonderful. And the revival and the manifestation of God's Spirit uh, was the greatest ever since Pentecost, Sister Wise says in Great Controversy, page 400. I think, I think that's the page. Let me just check it and make sure about that. Great, great Controversy, page 400. And we, we have a little concept today of how wonderful was the surge of power that flowed through God's people back when the, when the um, midnight cry began to sound. As Sister White says on page 400, in describing the, um, the work of the midnight cry, like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land from, from city to city, from village to village, and into remote country places went until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. Fanaticism disappeared before this proclamation like early frost before the rising sun. Believers saw their doubt and perplexity removed and hope and courage and animated their hearts. The work was free from those elements which are ever manifested when there is human excitement without the controlling influence of the Word and Spirit of God. It is similar in character to those seasons of humiliation and return to the Lord which among ancient Israel followed messages of reproof from his servants. It bore the characteristics that marked the work of God in every age. There was little ecstatic joy, but rather deep searching of heart, confession of sin and forsaking of the world. A preparation to meet the Lord was the burden of agonizing spirits. There was persevering prayer and unreserved consecration to God. Now, page 401, I read these words. Of all the great religious movements since the days of the Apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that of the autumn of 1844. Even now, after the lapse of many years, all who shared in that movement and who have stood firm upon the platform of truth still feel the holy influence of that blessed work and the witness that it was of God. So even though some religious writers might like you to think that the great Second Advent movement was a thing in the corner, it had no impact upon society. Don't you believe that? It was, it was the greatest movement since the days of Pentecost. I'll read it again. Of all the great religious movements since the days of the Apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than that movement of the autumn of 1844, which of course was the midnight cry. Well, I guess my time has gone, so I have to stop at this point and we'll pick up this theme again as we meet again at 7 o'clock this evening for our song service and the study period is 7.30.